Um, but it is time for this week's episode of the Gillette Labs Performance Rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on their second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's Performance Rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lack that intensity. Here we go. Uh, before we get started, we should mention a couple of things that we're not going to get to. As you said, Jer, there's Jarrett Burns, um, there's Rugby, there's John Ram, there's Liverpool, who had a brilliant win over Newcastle, and they're, let's be honest, within reach of the top four now. There is Marcus Rashford in the form of his life, probably the, the most informed footballer in the world right now, certainly in Europe. Uh, Israel Alatunde breaking the Irish 60 metre record, uh, trouncing it, in fact, by four one hundredth of a second, which doesn't sound like much, but it is at that level. Uh, and then Seamus Coleman for his goal that he definitely meant in Everton's 1-0 win over Leeds. Why is there any doubt about this? Like, he's a footballer who's played 400 Premier League games. <laughs> I think, there I is think when, he, when he kicks the ball in the direction of the goal, he probably intends to kick the ball in the direction of the goal. Why is there any doubt about this? Oh, he definitely meant it. He looks up, and he probably has done his research, and Ilan Melier probably knows he likes to stand a little bit off the line. He's a big man, so we can afford to do that. But uh, in this instance, Jesus, it, uh, it, didn't, it didn't pay off. As Colm said before the, before the show, it was, it was Roberto Carlos, but from the other side. And, uh, I mean, he, he couldn't have... He said after the game himself, I meant it. Now, if I hit it another 20, 30 times, it probably wouldn't go in, so it was perfect. But um, there's no doubt that he meant it. And everyone in Everton clearly loves him because the reaction to the goal was just brilliant. I do think it's interesting that every time a new manager comes in, uh, they don't always pick him for their first game, although Dyche did, but eventually they make sure that they have him in the team week in, week out. Like, every single one of those parade of mediocre managers has decided that they... If, as they are about to lose their job, the one person that they can trust who is around the club is Seamus Coleman, and uh, he's rewarding the faith of Sean Dyche. Yeah, it's attitude. Even when he's sitting on the bench, you can see that Seamus Coleman is a leader in that Everton team. So he's not in the performance ranking. He's not. That's, that's sorry, a bit I, of an oversight. We just had to mention. That's a bit of an oversight. Yeah. Evergreen, Seamus Coleman. We should have like a section where yeah. he's just in it every week. But okay, who else? Uh, yeah. Did you feel any guilt about leaving anybody else out? Uh, not really. I think I think Liverpool and United look had good weekends, but uh, certainly there's an argument for all of the, the inclusions that we have this morning. So we might start in the red and Chelsea, and I think Chelsea deserve to be in the red this morning because they had a howler yet again. Everyone's looking at this game. Oh, Stafford Bridge, Southampton at home, Southampton in relegation trouble. What an opportunity for Graham Potter to uh, address things that are that are going wrong, and it just wasn't good enough. Um, there's this bit, bit of siege mentality vibe I'm getting from Graham Potter at the moment. I have the quotes here from him at, uh, at full time. Uh, he says the criticism is understandable. We've had a tough period and are integrating a lot of young players. Excuses. A lot of people will say I'm the problem. And I'm not saying that their opinion is not worth articulating. My job is to work. What is it? Uh, they've won two of their past 14 games. Uh, the issue I would have here is the team that Graham Potter picked. So he's rested Thiago Silva, Rhys James, Kukurea, Ruben Loftus-Cheek and Hakim Ziyech. Six changes to the Borussia Dortmund game. I saw someone on Twitter describing it as a, it was a bit of a Carabao Cup team, as in, why are you making so many changes for a Premier League game that means so much? You're at home. You're against Southampton. Did you get ahead of yourself? Did you think you were going to win this game easily? Ruben Sellers has changed things at Southampton. And then, of course, James Ward-Prowse gets the free kick in front of goal. And we know what happens from that point on. So, uh, Fernandez, Kovacic, overrun in midfield. Uh, couldn't get the ball to Joao Felix properly whatsoever. Mason Mount struggled. Aubameyang sitting at home. Well, uh, 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 the team that he picked is good enough to win. The the changes, like, uh, but why you can't make like you, you, can, you don't see the top teams making six changes. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, like from a European match midweek, sometimes you do see them two make, or three make maybe. these types of changes. Potter as well hasn't really settled on like who his players are, like who are his dependables in that team, who are the ones that are going to pull out a performance for him, because realistically, all of them have been pretty rubbish all season. There are too many of them. There's also that. <laughs> well, that, that's a good excuse for. Sorry, and I mean a legitimate excuse for Potter. Like, ha, he's been handed this by Todd Bowley, a half a billion pounds worth of players. He doesn't have a striker, by the way, in that half a billion. And he does, Aubameyang sitting at home. Um, but you kind of feel sorry for Potter in that instance. Like, how is he supposed to bring in all these players? How is he supposed to keep all these egos happy? And there are a lot of egos in that Chelsea dressing room. And uh, I don't really feel hit. that sorry for him, though. Like, he knew what he was getting himself into with Chelsea, going to that 
team in terms of how they have been performing the last while, in terms of the ownership, what was expected, like all the reasons that Tuchel left in the first place. And I'm sure Graham Potter being in those circles probably knows a lot more about it than we do on the outside or like anything that comes through the media. So I do think he kind of knew what he was getting himself into. And he either backed himself completely to be able to stand up to the ownership and say, this is the sort of team that I want. Or he thought that he was able to bring the squad around and neither of those things have happened. And I think there has been this sort of attitude towards Potter a little bit where it's like, oh, he was handed a raw deal. And But when he first went, there was plenty of people questioning the fact of is he actually good enough to be manager of Chelsea at this stage? There was obviously some talent there and maybe a more of a raw talent than the sort of manager that normally goes to Chelsea. But I think, if anything, the last couple of months has proven that he's not really up to taking on a mess like that. Yeah. Todd Bowley's also in that range now where stories are coming out and whether or not they're true, they're believable. The bit about him assuming that they would qualify for the Champions League is doing the rounds at the moment. First published by Popovich about 10 days ago. They're in 10th, like. And, uh, but the point about the story is that Bowley didn't realise that they're not automatically in the... That's the oh, right. is. It's the same allegation like it, about him didn't realize. Okay. picking the four four three earlier on in the season and you're like, oh, the, you know, is someone going to tell him? So, I, look, the thing, these, these stories may well not be true, but they're all believable because they have yet to show that they have a plan in place around the acquisition of talent. And, I mean... Like, I don't know, the stories I read are like, oh, they've signed this 20-year-old or 18-year-old. He's like a very important part of their midfield regeneration. I'm like, this just sounds like you're just parroting the lines from the club, lads. Mm. Just sounds like somebody at the club has given you the information. And you're like, yeah, yeah. Because they haven't really been held to account, have they? No. No. Like, if this was Man United... Well, even the is it Neymar, the meetings that they had during the week when they were over there. And like, Bowley just went over, had lunch with different people trying to get Neymar to sign for Chelsea and you're like how many more how much more money can they spend because Neymar is not going to come cheaply but he's completely the wrong player for them as well yeah, yeah. the like, mood music has changed the, the, the boos at Chelsea a few weeks ago when they were losing were centred around probably the board and the bit of a mess the boos at the weekend were Graham Potter focused like there was literally an element of Potter being called to be sacked literally walking down the tunnel you quite audibly hear it and the journalists at the ground were reporting it as well, that that's what was being shouted at Potter. Uh, you're looking at the odds of the sack race here. He's 1-4 to four to be the next manager sacked in the Premier League. Gary O'Neill is 4-1. to one. So he's nowhere close to second favourite to be sacked. Um, so he's in trouble. And, and look, they'll, they'll wait and see what happens in the, uh, the Champions League this week. Can they progress? Or next week? Like, that's going to be fairly important. Uh, and I, I feel if Chelsea are knocked out of the Champions League... And, There's a good and chance they will be. They will be. They, they, they probably will be if they keep playing like this. Um, but it, it's just it's prolonging the inevitable I think I, I was I was a big fan of Graham Potter going to Chelsea I thought he'd, he'd do a good job uh, I thought the turtlenecks brought a, a sense of gravitas to him as well he, How far away are you from wearing a turtleneck? I'm, I'm a long way off turtleneck Days, days that's all Yeah I couldn't pull it off uh, Well uh, I mean pulling the um, the zip top up is kind of turtleneck yeah. it's in preparation you're laying the, the framework here Groundwork. so Yes. We expect to see less and less of your neck as time goes on. Did you guys not promise a couple of weeks ago that turtleneck season was coming fairly sharpish? I'll wear one. I'll wear one for a bet or for charity or something. <laughs> totally a great, uh, totally great initiative. But uh, yeah, no, I, I maybe will wear one at some point. Uh, all right. So That's Chelsea. Chelsea are in the red. Yep. Also in the red, Donegal. I was walking out of Clonus yesterday uh, afternoon at St Jurnix Park, and uh, there was a little tiny baby on the on the back of his uh, wearing a Donegal hat on the back of his dad's. Uh, Shoulders and the baby was doing a lot of smiling, and I was thinking, "This is this is a cute baby, Donegal baby." And myself and my dad were commenting about the fact that you know when you're that young, like Donegal have just lost, but the baby doesn't care because he doesn't know. Um, his dad turned around and and he's like, "Oh, off the ball!" And I was, and he, the only thing he said to me was, "Please don't put Donegal in the red ah. tomorrow morning." And I said, "I won't, I won't. But don't be in the red." You lied. I, I unfortunately to that man, I apologize, and to his cute baby, I apologize this morning, but. We have to put Donegal in the red, uh, not just because of what happened on the pitch yesterday at St. Jernick's Park, but, but also, I guess, everything that's going on off the pitch. It's a bit of a mess. And uh, I was reading articles uh, earlier in the week, uh, before the weekend, ahead of the game, and, and Donegal Live had a, a headline that really summed it up. Chris McNulty wrote a piece and he said, Donegal GEA is at one of the most critical crossroads in its history. You look at all the players in that Donegal Academy and the mess that's going on at the moment with Carl Lacey leaving this simmering row, 
that uh, that started with his departure on February 3rd. Lack of support from the county board. We've heard nothing from the Donegal county board at the moment. Um, and, and that was kind of just hammered home by the defeat yesterday on the pitch, which, which, which wasn't great. Donegal, a lot of people's favourites to go down maybe, along with Monaghan from Division 1 this year. Yesterday was, was, a, was a must win for both teams and Monaghan got over the line by eight points uh, fairly convincingly in the second half. But I'd be, I'd be very, very concerned if I was a Donegal fan. But the Paddy McBrady hamstring injury also requires surgery and recovery from that's going to be very difficult. Like When you think back to just how excited they were with the opening round of the league where McBrady finishes off a move deep into stoppage time to win the opening round of league fixtures against the All-Ireland champions mm. and so many of the young players who looked really vibrant and great and you're like, okay, this is actually all going to be fine. Since then, as you said, off the field, whatever's going on and I, I, I don't know enough about it, but it doesn't seem great when somebody as highly rated as Carl Lacey is walking away and then everybody else walks away too. Uh, that seems like it's a, a pretty drastic situation. And then you add in the fact now that it looks very ominous for them and there'll be a Division 2 team next year. And just the slow, steady climb back is always difficult. So um, the post-Michael Murphy era is as bleak as it could have been for Donegal. Yeah, like th- there were some... some Bright shoots yesterday. I was watching Caelan McGonigal is a brilliant player. He was the guy who was man of the match against Kerry and stood beside McBrearty on TV afterwards doing the interview. He was kind of picked up, picked up a bit of a knock yesterday. Was taken off eventually. Michael Langan's a brilliant player. Uh, Gallon's a brilliant player. They have some really, really good footballers. Darrell Boyle as well. I really like. So they have them there. Ryan McHugh is another lad who hasn't come back, of course, from injury yet. Along with McBrearty, he was very much absent yesterday. Um, but I would just be very, very worried about about Donegal and and, and the year ahead. They're, they're, they're not going to do much, let's be honest. And look, it's a new manager in charge. You'll give Paddy Carr a bit of time, but he's been handed a raw deal when you have Michael Murphy retiring. Um, but the, the, the simmering row that's going on behind the scenes and, and the quote, sorry, when the, the collective statement from all these coaches that were retiring as, or, uh, uh, resigning, as a group, we've lost all confidence in governance of Donegal GEA. So the coaching, performance, logistics staff, all quitting. The only ones staying on board were the, were the ones over the, I think it was the 17s and 20s teams maybe that were still ongoing in their, in their um, campaigns. So they just didn't want to cause disruption for those players. So they stayed, in, uh, stayed on board. Uh, whatever's happening, um, Dudley Golgi, I need to come out and say something. To put it in context as well for people who haven't like listened to the story, it's like up to 40 coaches apparently have lot. resigned across the county. You know, it's not just like a couple of teams worth of coaches, like 40 coaches. That's a lot of people to follow out one person and it just shows like how deeply rooted the mistrust in Donegal GAA must be at the moment. It's it, it's concerning. It's very, very concerning. And y- you'll give them a little bit of leeway on the pitch. Um, like They have a big game next. I think it's Galway they have up next. That's a big game. Um, but th- they're staring Division 2 down the barrel. It, look, it's not the, wor- it's not the worst thing in the world going down to Division 2. Dublin and Kildare down, down there this year, yeah, it'll not yeah. do them any damage. Well, you know, uh, is there a Talton Cup in their future in, in the next couple of years? If you, like, you don't arrest this slide all of a sudden. Yeah, you don't want to get two, two relegations. You know, if, and if you're drawn next year in the preliminary round of Ulster, you've got a long way to climb out to be um, able to make it to Sam Maguire. Uh, that's the chickens coming home to roost, lads. But anyway, yeah. Um, Ten Hag has lost a run of himself, getting very confident, says Connor Joyce in our comments. Man United have the most points in the league since the third game after the two opening disasters. Obviously, those two count, but it's still interesting. I mean, yeah, there's always ways to cut the season so that you're the champions. Calendar year, since ex-manager came in, post-World Cup. Post-World Cup? Mm. Marcus Rashford's the greatest footballer in the world. Um, Sorry, losing the run of himself, how? Like... Is that a, is that meant in a negative sense? I wonder because because there's no there's nothing about Ten Hag's demeanor at the moment that I would construe as. He celebrated negative. at the end, Shane. That's more oh, than enough. Jesus, uh, I know. But I, sorry, are, are you are you saying that Arteta didn't lose it on sidelines last week? Uh, no, but I'm saying that like I I don't agree with this general perception there is of Arteta that like whenever he gets angry on the sidelines, it's a bad sign or it's something that's not good. Like he's been doing it all season. I like the De Bruyne stuff was ridiculous. I totally agree with that, but it's just been a general criticism of Arteta all season. Well, and I, all, it, I don't I don't understand it. I has, think has it been general? Is it not just your man in Qatar? What's his name? Keezy Keezy it is Keezy, isn't it? He's like, oh, he stepped outside his 
oh, he should be in his yeah, whatever. That's all Grant. But it did feel like the. But like when Guardiola does it and stuff, there's not the same sort of commentary around it. Or no one's like he's losing the run of himself, on, and he'll literally be like lying on the ground in the technical box, like hands over his head, weeping at times. You know, it's just I don't know. It's a display of. I do agree. It did cross the line with De Bruyne and stuff. I don't like seeing that, but. Especially when De Bruyne was so smug about it afterwards. I'm taking what Connor has said there. He's, Connor has commented Ten Hag has lost the run of himself. I'm taking that with a pinch of salt because Connor, you've always also said Gallon hasn't played in two years. I was at the game yesterday. Oshin Gallon was playing. He was back in the team. He scored five points. Like he was there. So uh, take my word for it. Don't worry, Monaghan will be following Donegal into Division Two. Says Connor Joyce. Quite possibly. Uh, Same Connor. <laughs> he's he's winding me up this morning. There you go. There there is quite a big chance that Monaghan will follow Donegal down to Division Two, but they were impressive yesterday. McManus was back. McManus came. came what a cheer when he came off the bench. Uh, two really, really good attacking marks within three minutes of coming on. Jack McCarn back in the team as well. Seven points. Played really well. Sean so Jones. So you're feeling it again? Well, Monaghan fans are feeling you, you need a win at, at home. You and Roscommon in town next Sunday as well in Clonus, which is going to be a big one. Never back against Monaghan in the relegation scrap. No, no. Uh, Shifty Lad says, Good morning, everyone. Great weekend of sport. Man United now have a momentum. I'd say Jerry would agree with me on that. Thumbs up. Uh, well, they're certainly playing with a lot of confidence. Mm. That's important. Um, Should we move on to Amber? Move on to Amber, yeah. Move on to the dubs because uh, I, I look, I personally, any Dublin fans watching would not have had Dublin in Amber this morning, but uh, the, the, the rest of the production team decided uh, we put them in hey, Amber. Hey, throwing us under the bus there, All of, Shane, you, all of you under the bus. Are the, you? Yeah, 100%. Well, that's not, it's like uh, no I in team, buddy. From my perspective, from my perspective, Dublin have three, point, three wins from three. They've beaten Kildare, they've beaten Limerick, they've beaten Cork in a tough game down in Parky Cueve. Look, they weren't brilliant yesterday, Dublin, but let's look at the positives. Jack McCaffrey, three years out, he comes back on to put on a Dublin jersey and he's brilliant. He clearly hasn't lost any of the pace that he, that he uh, once had, Jack McCaffrey. Uh, James McCarthy was on the pitch as well. It was just more of a familiar looking Dublin team. Um, David O'Hanlon as well, the goalkeeper, uh, with, a, with a brilliant save from, uh, from Brian Hurley with that last, last gasp goal chance. Yeah, but, uh, Cork could have really, really snatched all two points. They had the game home and hosed, done and dusted, and you expected them to be able to just strangle the life out of Cork, but they couldn't do it. No, they but kept Cork are a good up, team. Can we, can they, we? they kept coughing up chances. Yeah, okay, fair enough. But like, it is still a Division Two league game where you do have, you know, six hundred All Ireland titles and medals coming off the bench and being able to influence things. And look, Jack McCarthy looked absolutely great. I think the physical fitness of the main players is, is important. But their half-forward line scored a point. Their, their full-back line scored more than their half-forward line did from um, a starting position. Mm. And look, yeah, you can blah, 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 whatever. But it's just, I don't know, I, I thought that uh, it's trending in a reasonable direction, but they're definitely not in the green yet. Like, most of those Division One teams are playing football at a higher level than the Dubs are at the moment. They, they beat Limerick. They beat Kildare in the opening game of the season, and Kildare have been not good so far. And I think they'd be Good the first to admit that. There, I mean, it wasn't though. If it, like I was talking yeah. to Tommy, and he was like, "They were shocking." And um, we get Tommy on during the week whenever we're doing the power rankings, and he can explain why. Like, you know, again, Clare are a perennial Division Two team. Clare just about able to get over them. The Dubs just about able to get over them. Meath hammered Cork. Meath were shocking at the weekend. Mm. Mm. So Division Two fair is not great. Good pitch, um, you know, and brilliant. Nice little training ground run out for the Dubs. And 10, 000, ten thousand fans. Maybe that's what they need at this stage of the season. And sorry, a first win in Cork since nineteen ninety, which I hadn't realised before the game. Um, that's that's an incredible record. So uh, to get that monkey off the back, they haven't played down in Cork since twenty sixteen, uh, albeit. But um, I think I think Desi Farrell will be quite happy after the weekend. I mean. Saturday the 4th of March, that's the date you should all stick in your Division 2 diaries because that's Celtic Park, Derry, Derry versus Dublin. Well, like, yeah, if, you, if, if Derry would confirm that they're going all out for us, I'd be happy. Derry, Derry are unbelievable so far in Division 2. Yeah, look, I think um, Derry are the best team in Division 2 by a mile at the moment. They're also the best team in, in Ulster. They could already be qualified for Division 1 by that time that fixture rolls around, right? Am I, am I right? No, it's only... It's only uh, it's the game after the next one, I think. Okay, okay. I think so. Well, yeah, okay, fair enough. So th- there'll be something at least to play for. Um, now, the, the, the two of them could, could have steamrolled and, and won their next game and then they'll be kind of going up together and it'll be a bit of a, a tame affair, potentially. But if, if, um, if Dublin had lost that game, where would they be? So this is the Dublin team we're supposed to win every game because they're, remember, the greatest team of all time, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the standard that they're aspiring to is that they were the greatest team of all time and the vast majority of the players 
who are starting, maybe not the vast majority, but certainly a, a core of that team is still around who know what, what those standards are. That's why that's why they have to be in amber at the moment. You can't put them in green because they're not swatting teams away. They don't look to have the forward power that they've had in previous years. Khan is, it turns out, not a winter footballer. Maybe it's, mm. he's just a summer footballer and we'll see him back to his normal form. Um, we're taking that as a, a just a kind of, because we've seen the movie so much, but we haven't just seen that form yet from him in the league. And they should absolutely have lost the game yesterday. The first red card that, uh, the, that was given out was Cork, to Cork. Yeah, Ian McGuire. Like, it was ridiculous. Cork manager afterwards is like, look, we see this every year in the league. We do see this every year in the league. We see these nonsensical decisions. Like the pull of the jersey mean, for half a second. Like it's barely a, it's a foul. Fair it wasn't enough. even it wasn't even an egregious shirt pull that was like stopping a scoring opportunity. No, so quick. So that was the second yellow. And unless he said something, but I, 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 the referee seemed to say it was like your third one. You know, it's your third foul. And it's actually for consistent fouling. So maybe, but again, we don't get to hear this because we don't hear from them afterwards. But there should have been a goal given in the first half. Yeah, sorry, the the square ball. The the, the, the square ball situation. Connor Glass tweeted at 5.20pm yesterday evening and he, just as he tweeted I was thinking the same thing. He tweeted, square ball is the worst rule in Gaelic. Pointless. Uh, footballers hate it. Because what is the point of it? The point of it is to defend goalkeepers but there's, a, there's already a rule there to defend goalkeepers and that's if a goalkeeper is fouled it's a free out. There's your rule to defend goalkeepers. But it stops goal hanging. Yeah, go, but... but why? Why do we want to stop goal hanging? Who cares if the like if if a player want, if a team wants to utilize one or two of their players in a box and use up that space? That's on them because they're leaving gaps elsewhere. Like it doesn't make sense. It happened in the Louth game as well yesterday. Now Sharkey, I think it was for Louth. I don't even think this was a square ball. Is the thing your man's literally standing on the edge of the square, looking at the edge, going, "I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking." Balls in the air. But how can it? How can the? How can, the umpires aren't actually looking at the at, like. You'd want to be an unbelievable umpire to be thinking as the ball is kicked. Right, where's his foot? Is it on the line? Is it on the paint? Is that like this? Isn't we've we no VAR in, in Gaelic to that effect. Like there's there's nothing to say that a decision can be made definitively. The square ball rule needs got rid of. I know this is the worst timing ever to be saying this. Yeah, good match, Con- Well, it's Monday after GA Congress. Yeah, well, well done. We've got to wait a whole bloody year for this now. Well, <laughs> do you know what you can do? Are you Scotstown? I'm on and Harps. Mon and Harps. Well, you can go. You can go to your own club. Get the motion going. This is this is your challenge now. Yeah. Can GA democracy work? Can you like be the little butterfly that flaps its wings? Let's do it and unleash chaos at uh, Congress twenty twenty four. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I know that between that and the attacking mark, that's two of the rules that a lot of people don't uh, don't enjoy, especially Gaelic footballers, which is is quite important. They're, they're, I mean, their opinion matters. So maybe that's why it's an amber. Why were why were Kerry not um, at why, it? Why have we not heard from Kerry so far? Absolutely hockey by me by, by Mayo. Should they've been in the red? Nah. You can't put them in the red. Sean O'Shea and David Clifford came back. I think there's um, every reason to put them in the green. Yeah. After a defeat like that. <laughs> a little bit of narkiness in training. Yeah. 100%. Clifford back. O'Shea back. Bit the beast. Um, I'd, be, I'd be concerned because... Damping, damping down the, the, uh, their lead mm. in the power rankings. Well, they're not, we'll get on to that because they're not in the green, but the team that beat them are in the green. And uh, Cassini will enjoy this because Connacht football generally is in the green. I have to say, I think this is bullshit. Why? Because the only team from uh, Connacht who really deserves to be in it at the moment are the Rossies. Yeah, like, well, they certainly deserve it. Yeah, but uh, it should be Davy himself and the whole team. He's 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 given the best post match copy. His team have like absolutely surprised everybody by coming up and not just being patsies. And the way they're winning games, they're winning all sorts of games. Yeah, they're like they're yeah. a second half team. Or, sorry, they're not a second half team. They're a brilliant team, but they have won so. And many he keeps games dropping lads every week. Yeah. And then they come off the bench and they they all make an impact. I'm like, this guy has a little bit of something, a little a little sprinkling of started. Look, Mayo were absolutely brilliant, um, but uh, I think that it's just the general wave though, and like it's shown by the fact that all the teams won over the weekend, like Sligo. How did Leitrim do? Okay, not Leitrim. <laughs> See, in a, in a game, I, I do forget about them sometimes, and I do apologize hey. for that. But like. I don't know. Like it's rare that you actually get a weekend where the uh, most of Connacht GA are very successful. Wouldn't have expected that performance from Mayo at the weekend at all. I mean, they were the performances they've put in so far this season have not been great. Like Paddy Durkin wasn't starting. They had you know a couple of issues on the team. Still came out, performed really well. Fifteen thousand in Castlebar. Unbeaten in three games. Uh, unbeaten a, a in draw, three games. A draw against Armagh, a draw against Galway. Like. 
and but like you imagine with Mayo, they're like they're not going to be happy with those two draws. No, it's that kind of classic thing of unbeaten in three games, but also it was two draws that were considered like bad draws mm. um, for them. So like no one thought they were going to come out and do it. Roscommon are absolutely flying it this year, and I really hope it continues into the rest of the championship because I just think it'll be such a great addition. And it's just always nice seeing teams like Sligo and Galway up there as well. I love that. I love Davy Burke versus Kieran McGinney, two guys mm. who. To say they wear their heart in their sleeve, it would be an understatement. Like Davey, the, the moment I knew Ross Common were okay this year is when Davy Burke was in studio with us a couple of months ago and I was like, oh my God. I wanted to run laps around Marconi House when he left. Yeah. Like, this guy is so inspirational. He's unbelievable. I, I, I remember chatting, was walking into a nightclub in Monaghan uh, uh, just when Davy Burke was being announced and Greg McGonagall is working on the door of one of these uh, nightclubs and he's the former Dublin ladies manager and Davy Burke was his number two and he says, this guy is unbelievable. Like... Puts so much work and research in. You saw the reaction from him at full time as well. The Roscommon players have bought in. Oh yeah, and they are fully bought in. Like even the reaction of like Roscommon fans when we had Davy Burke in. Like I don't think there's been a county manager that we've had in that say like our social media platforms were just going crazy oh. with people being like, "We love him. <laughs> he is great. We are so excited for this season." Yeah. And at the time, I was like, "That's a little bit strange," you know. I didn't. I just didn't really expect all that much from Roscommon this season, and now obviously they've proved me incredibly wrong. The Rossies love their football, let me tell you. And Jesus, like I did say to Davey when he was leaving that day, I said, "Look, just maybe take it easy on Monaghan in the league." And they have Monaghan up next. They've got their six points. Down tools, lads. Leave no. it. No, no, there's a, there's a bit of silverware there for them if there they is. want. You there know? is. Like. Uh, the thing I'd say about Armagh yesterday is Jason Duffy kicked four very, very good early points for Armagh, but one of them, I think it was the last of them, he literally could have passed the ball across um, and it was a goal chance for Rory Grugan. If you're away from home against someone like Russ Common in the form they're in, you have to go for goal when you have the chance and he should have Hindsight's twenty twenty. But sorry, um, am I am I mixing them up? Is he is he the mullet? He's the mullet ginger. Ah, left yeah. and right. Yeah, brilliant footballer. Yeah, uh, but he should have definitely laid that one off to Rory Grugan because it would have been a certain goal. Instantly into top ten all time mullets. Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Gary Mohans from Monaghan last year was brilliant as well. We've had some we've had some crackers. What was the who's the awfully under twenty footballer? I can't remember his name. Oh yeah, forgive me. Someone in the comments will tell us. Uh, that was that was number one for me. But um, Russ Common, brilliant. Mayo, excellent. Galway. With a with an impressive win in let's call them dire conditions in Chum Stadium. Chum Stadium always looks so so bleak, but uh, look particularly bleak at the weekend. Uh, but a three point win for Tyrone. Like Cal Sweeney came off the bench at half time and kicked three points. Very impressed with him. Peter Cook is back in the panel for Galway as well. Yvian Burke kicking scores. Um, Conroy was very good. I think Paulie Joyce is going to be licking his lips because even he was asked after the match yesterday talking about Damien Comer was at the game and walking around and. I think it's six to eight weeks, he had said after the game now, which is... That's not too bad. No, it's not too bad. And it's shorter than, than had been expected. So a really positive weekend. Sligo as well. This is why we threw them in. He'll be back for Croker. He'll be back for Croker. Sligo beat Waterford by uh, 21 points to 13. So two out of three for Sligo. And they deserve to be mentioned here as well, guys, because... Yeah, but they beat Waterford. Yeah, 100%. But let's... let's look, they're, they're quite likely going to be in a Connacht final, Sligo. So we're going to get to know some of these players. Sean Carabine being one of them. Kicked eight points yesterday. So I think we should give them the credit where credit's due. You can only beat the teams in front of you, and they are in Division 4. But back in the promotion hunt, Leash leading the, the fold there in Division 4. But um, what a weekend for Connacht football. Uh, Shane says, not a mention of the League of Ireland after the opening weekend of fixtures. I uh, would have thought that would have been the Sligo story we were talking about. Great right result for them. 97, mm. 98 minutes in. Uh, last minute equaliser, but um, I don't know. You know those, That game could have been shown on TV. The, the defending champions going for a four-peat. Um, instead, we're watching the URC on the weekend where there's none of the best players playing. Yeah. Something's gone wrong there, folks. Leinster hawking a team once again. Uh, Cormac Egan is the Offaly Mullet uh, individual. Thank you for that uh, reminder. Enda uh, Smith, best player in the Roscommon team, top class player. He is unbelievable. What a player. Um, the Murtas as well. Ben O'Carroll deserves a shout out, as, as pointed out in the comments. I really like this Roscommon team, lads. I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be so, I'm gonna be more tuned into the Connacht Championship than the uh, Ulster Championship this year. Albeit the it's fairly one sided the draw. So why is it Connacht not just Ross Common? Asks Paul Byrne. And square ball was brought in to stop Marathi goalies being killed. What a terrible rule, says uh, Danny McQuan. There was the uh, Marathi goalies. There's also like the flying elbow into the face of the goalkeeper. That you know. It's the free out then. Yeah, but like it's too late. Yeah, if your nose is broken, it's too late. <laughs> I don't know. I think it needs got rid of. It's it's ruining the game for me. 
Uh, Bobby Dwyer, a resident Spurs fan, so you can uh, take this with whatever. You, the, <laughs> Arteta, an absolute embarrassment. And Pep has a little more credit in the bank on what he can get away with on the sidelines. Uh, I, I, I don't really have any problems with the uh, stuff on the sidelines week to week. It's the, occasionally it gets too much and then you lose the run of yourself. Uh, uh, anyway, sure, look, we're, we're in the we're red now. That. We're, we're in the green. Yeah, Sorry. The, the ultra green is Arsenal, so we might as well move there. Um, the, the highlight for me was hearing the stories afterwards from the press box. I'm sure you've you heard what, what went on. There was a few antics. So the Arsenal first team assistant coach, Miguel Molina, and the Aston Villa head performance analyst, Victor Manas, who is a former Arsenal employee, he was under Emery's uh, backroom team at Arsenal, had an altercation which apparently became physical in the press box. So the Villa staff were apparently unhappy about how Arsenal celebrated the uh, own goal from Emmy Martinez, and shit just hits the fan in the press box which is what you want to hear you want to hear these stories and uh, look why wouldn't the Arsenal staff celebrate it's a, it's a goal to, to potentially save their title charge put them 3-2 up late on at Villa Park a tough place to go and Emmy Martinez who is the king of shithousery lets the ball in off the back of his head couldn't do much about it to be fair to the man but um, just one of those one of those games as we said earlier guys you need to win these types of games Zinchenko's first Premier League goal which I couldn't believe I was like oh yeah he's never scored in the Premier League uh, which was madness. Um, the strike from Jorginho too was out of this world, and Saka and Odegaard were unsurprisingly brilliant. So, um, I mean, they deserve to be top of the green, don't they? It just is like it's a lot of the names that you would expect to pull Arsenal out of this. You know, having Odegaard there, Saka. Uh, Saka was getting an awful time of it, mm. and I am slightly worried about the game time that he's playing. Like being such a young player and he has had a couple of issues with his hamstring and stuff already I would be kind of worried about that for his future I think they need to find better backup I, I mean I've said this for a long time I think Arsenal in general need better depth uh, I did feel a little bit for I mean Martinez I mean is one of those did ones. you? well I just I always really liked him when he was at Arsenal like I remember when we won the FA Cup and he like broke down in tears and he was always such a big Arsenal man and I know like he does have that whole sort of shithousery thing where he you know gets in people's faces and stuff but I was like oh of all people to actually gift us this it had to be him really <laughs> I did think that uh, oh karma finally catches up with him it's like he won a World Cup lads steady on this is, yeah. the, this is the league game he's going to forget you know in six weeks time but he won a World Cup so I'm not really sure if karma tracked him down and beat him over the head or if like no yeah. I don't think so he won the World Cup it's a third straight defeat for Villa they're 11th at the table they need to arrest that form pretty quickly and Arsenal have Leicester next Leicester team that lost of course 3-0 to Manchester United yesterday and then they play Everton the team that of course beat them only two weeks ago uh, at the Emirates so uh, the next couple of weeks for Arsenal so are they awesome. Are they? have they responded Kathleen are you happy that um, things have turned around uh, well like obviously you want a more convincing win than it necessarily was like the scoreline puts a sheen on it but realistically we needed an own goal and it took us until like the 90th minute to actually in any way secure the win but also it's like Shane was saying to actually <coughs> win titles or win championships you need these dirty wins you need to prove that you can pull it out of the bag when you are a bit down I all I wanted out of Arsenal this weekend to be honest was to come out and give a win I think if they had got a draw or a loss I would have seen a lot more in the okay City beat them the title race is over all that sort of crack but I said it when I was on the show after the City game that I didn't think this was Arsenal down and out at all I thought it was like definitely a slip up and I'm not entirely sure when we play City again are we going to beat them but these are the sort of games we need to be winning especially when City are getting the results that they did at the weekend yeah we haven't even mentioned that. The Chris Wood's goal took, robbed two points for Man City. I mean, what a weekend for Arsenal. Erling Haaland missed an absolute sitter. Yeah. So much possession for City, but possession means not if you can't get the win. So uh, that's worrying for Man City. But this is the thing. Like We talked about this uh, after the Arsenal City game and we were like, oh, have Arsenal messed up? Have they given this away? But like you look at the results City had at the weekend, like when they've been tripped up by Everton, they've had as many trips as Arsenal and that's partly the reason why Arsenal are in this position now. So yes, I know they have the history and that they have done it before and we have a lot more expectation for them. But also, the results don't lie at the moment. And I... Just think there's still a long time to go until the end of this race. A lot of teams getting joy against Man City down that, that mm. gaping Cancelo-sized hole, <laughs> it seems to be, for whatever reason. Um, Pep's hubris. But there's, there was no fight between them, according to Cancelo. It's seven minutes past eight. That's this week's episode of the Gillette Labs Performance Rankings.